Good morning and welcome to Sunday service with the Potomac Valley Church, a community for all people committed to learning what it means to be the church. We're glad you decided to join us for worship. We hope and pray that this is a time that you were able to connect to one another, to the word, but most importantly, to worship God. Let's continue with some songs of worship.
give myself away. I give myself away so you can use me. I give myself away. Myself away so you can use me. Here I am, here I stand. Lord, my life is in your hands. Lord, I long to see.
Hello everyone, my name is Summer Key and I'd like to share with you some information about giving financially at our church. Before we talk about how to give, let's talk about where it goes. Whenever you give to the Potomac Valley Church, you'll have three options to specify where that money goes. General operations, which supports our church's operating expenses. Benevolence, which we save specifically in order to provide for members in crisis or community members who come to us in need. And lastly, missions, which is the most wide reaching category that serves needs locally and abroad with our family of churches and the communities they serve. Now that we know where your financial gift will go, let's talk about how to give. For those of you prepared to give today, you can give online through your own bank using the bill pay function. You can also give through our mobile app using easy and secure payments with PushPay. Finally, you can mail a check or money order to our church office and payments will be processed through our bank weekly. If you missed anything or need additional details and clarification, you can find all of this and more on our website at www.potomacvalleychurch.com slash give. Thank you so much for your participation and heart to serve with a financial gift today. Potomac Valley Church. My name is Amanda Leitsky and this is my husband Brian Leitsky and we're going to be sharing the communion message with you today. You can turn your Bibles over to Isaiah chapter 30. We're going to be reading verses 15 through 17. For thus said the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest you shall be saved, in quietness and in trust shall be your strength. But you were unwilling and you said, no, we will flee upon horses, therefore you shall flee away. And we will ride upon swift steeds, therefore your pursuers, pursuers shall be swift. A thousand shall flee at the threat of one. At the threat of five, you shall flee till you are left like a flagstaff on the top of a mountain, like a signal on a hill. These verses show us where Judah's strength came from. He held to God's promise that returning and repenting and resting and trusting in God would bring him strength. But the, at the sign of one threat, this city turns from God's promise and takes matters into their own hands. They engage in a battle out of fear of the threats of the world around them, only to leave their city completely destroyed until the flagpole on the hill is all that is left of them and their land. What is it in your life where you have taken matters into your own hands instead of trusting God to be faithful to his promise of giving you rest, peace, and direction? I know for me specifically, this test of trust in God has been especially challenging these past few weeks, and I have admittedly failed numerous times. I returned to work for the first time in five years as a first-time preschool teacher in a school that is meeting in person. The whole staff has been working tirelessly to ensure we follow all the precautions and adding our own additional precautions to make sure our school is a safe environment for our students and their families. In addition to making sure my classroom and school is a safe place, I've been trying to get our three and four-year-old daughters to and from their classes at the school with all of their supplies and with the extra precautionary measures. 
Our son started kindergarten virtually and is currently in Minnesota with his grandparents as Brian and I are both working. This week and last week for me has been calls and texts while I've been at work from my parents struggling with technology challenges as the school learns a new system, helping my in-laws learn the system as our son moved to their house earlier this week for virtual school, a five-year-old who doesn't want to sit in front of a computer for five hours a day, a classroom that requires extra sanitization measures and precautions that I have not felt routine yet, especially while my three-year-old three and four-year-old daughters are in the room with me after class and before class. Students who desperately want to hug and touch each other in a house that is filled with an endless pile of dishes and laundry. I've struggled with anxiety since I was a teenager, but it was within the past few years that I was diagnosed with anxiety-induced depression. So when my anxiety gets so high, my body switches to a state of depression to cope with that anxiety. These past few weeks have, for me have been battling the fires as they arise, but also fearing what will, I will do next month when our son is home and we're trying to complete his virtual school and both of us are still working. It is wanting to find a solution before the battle gets too big. It's trying to check my anxiety level to make sure that I'm not on the verge of a depressive episode. I need to focus on these verses and what God says in them and see that my own attempts to control what is out of my hands will only lead to my own destruction and separation from God. And the more that attempt to control these things, the more I turn away from the sacrifice that Jesus made when he gave his life for me on the cross. And now Brian's going to share. I think if Amanda and I are honest with you as our church family, each of us has to admit our sinful human skepticism over whether or not we can live out verse 15, whether we're just like the people unwilling in Isaiah instead. Resting, repentant trust in God sure doesn't seem like the way to get the dishes and the laundry done, the house clean, the oil changed, Lincoln's tech issues with his grandparents' tech issues fixed, or even to determine what we were going to say here today. My failure to find the faithful rest Amanda describes from this, these verses is the result of busyness, misprioritization, and ultimately my need for control. You ever feel like there's so much to do? You'll never, get it, you'll never get it all done. You'll never find the end of your list. I sure do, and it's a lens through which I read these verses. Right around when coronavirus started last March, Pastor Will had been working through a series of lessons contrasting a world that rewards and values us based on what we do against our discipleship call to be the church. I can certainly admit my own failure to prioritize being over doing, even before the busyness of Amanda starting work and the kids starting school. I can also faithlessly claim the excuses of important tasks and even duty. Yet the verse, um, verses Amanda chose in Isaiah are a divine reminder that any excuse is merely an attempt at my own control. It doesn't take a very long quiet time to identify many moments I could and should have put faith in God and family first. Communion is about remembrance of Christ's singularly faithful and immeasurable sacrifice for our sins. Every time I make the mistakes, in this page of Isaiah, I justify his crucifixion. I can never earn grace and salvation, but I can repent, repent. I can rest, and I can trust. I can make quiet time, and I can continue committing to prioritize faith and our family. We live in a time that pushes us from almost every direction to misprioritize these things. As we take bread in remembrance of Jesus' body, and as we drink wine or juice in remembrance of his blood, I hope it can be a renewal for us to make the quiet time we need to set priorities based on his example and his word, to put our faith and our family before the work we do, to love our neighbors and our enemies, to be the church together, and to repent and rest in quietness and trust, and to help each other embody the city set on a hill in Matthew instead of his flagstaff in Isaiah. Please bow your heads in a prayer with me as we go towards communion. Dear God, we're just so grateful for your promise, your from, promise of rest and peace. Whatever that is for us, some of us, like Brian and I, may need a little more rest uh, in a time of busyness. And some of us have felt um, immense peace and separation potentially during this time of, of COVID um, and being at home. I just ask that whatever we need at this time, that we cling to your promise. Um, that all can be found in you um, and that we don't take matters into our own hands and justify you having to die on the cross for us.
Help us remember that sacrifice and remember your promises and that you will always keep them. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Welcome to the Potomac Valley Church. This is our online worship service. Welcome, thank you so much for watching this video. If you have been joining us, you certainly know that we have been in a September to Remember. We began September to Remember. Will reminded us about remembering who God is. And last week, Marcus Thomas, our newly minted evangelist who was appointed last week, Preach to us about the power, remembering the power of the gospel. We're going to continue on in our September to remember today, this morning, talking about remembering the power of gratitude. Today, we talk about remembering the power of gratitude. This building that I'm speaking in, that's recording this message right now, this year was bought, this year renovated this year and two weeks ago it softly reopened as well and when this building was bought it did not look like what you see right now in fact it was a lot different if you got a chance to see it so much work so much sweat so much thought has been put into making this beautiful building amazing and wonderful and warm and inviting and welcoming, allowing us now to softly reopen. The church doors have been opened. This is the service where we wanna thank all of those who have come, all of those who have been contracted to work and really make this beautiful building amazing in what it is right now. We are so grateful for you guys uh, we want to thank some specific people. Of course, we want to thank John and Wanda Hewitt and H&N Construction for all the renovations that you did, all the carpenters and laborers from H&N. We want to thank Nash Roofing, Trek Electric, Jim's Plumbing and Gas, Children's Heating and AC, the RNG Contractors, the Carpet House Design Center, and all the floor installers, all the and TNC Cleaning. We want to thank you all. Thank you so much for making this beautiful, making this building so beautiful and wonderful. Thank you so much for doing what you've done to have this house of worship that we are in right now. I also wanna thank the members of the church who have come by to serve, to take out the trash, to clean, to simply mow the lawn. I know we have a lot of grass, five acres of land. Thank you so much for coming to serve and helping out in this way. Those who have volunteered to come and to paint Thank you. Thank you so much. Those who have been contracted to work and those who just came on, on a volunteer basis. Thank you. Thank you so much. And if I do not mention your name, I do apologize. Know that you have great treasure in heaven. But most importantly, I want to thank the church personally for your gracious giving, your generosity to buy this building in a pandemic. I am so overwhelmed with gratitude that my family and I are here. We feel so loved and taken care of here. You know, the beginning of 2020, we never thought that we would be in Virginia. We never thought we would move to Fredericksburg. We never thought 
we'd be in a different state, in a whole new church. I wish I could meet everyone personally and look you in the eyes and tell you, thank you, thank you. I want to remind you of what happened to bring us here. You guys decided in your shameless audacity to buy a building in a global pandemic. You decided to renovate this building in a global pandemic. And while people were losing their jobs, people were on furlough, you guys decided to hire a couple to lead the Rappahannock campus here. You decided to hire us in a global pandemic. And, and as people are still being laid off and on furlough, you guys not only met your special missions contribution, but gave $25,000 over that for sure. No other reason than gratitude. Gratitude to God. Me and my family being here, we are a direct response to your gratitude, your overwhelming gratitude to give, to serve. One day, when there are more campuses, one day, when there are more people in this church building, POVA is a lot larger. One day when we launch other churches, other campuses, it will be because of the direct response of the power of gratitude and giving. And as this world makes sense of what's going on right now, we have a lot going on. We have a lot that is vying for attention. There is still the coronavirus. There is an election coming up. School has started. And as the rest of the world is trying to make sense of what's going on and how we navigate through some uncertain waters, uncharted waters, the church here is resolute in its, in, in, in its, in its promise to gather, to serve, and to multiply. This is the power of gratitude. And Others might think, buying a building right now, that's crazy. Hiring another couple on staff, that's crazy. Renovating a church building in a global pandemic, that's crazy. But I think, no, that's the power of gratitude. That is the power of gratitude. Why? Because first and foremost, we're grateful to God. We are grateful to God. You know, I'm so grateful for the people of the kingdom of God. My son just turned three couple of days ago. My daughter is nine months old. And oftentimes when you have children of your very own, especially little ones, you know, having immediate family is so important just for the support, just so they can watch your kids. So you can just, for the most part, maintain your sanity. Young parents know what I'm talking about. All parents know what I'm talking about. But ever since we've had children, my family has been six hours away by flight. Victoria's family in West Virginia is right now five hours away by drive and previously nine hours away by drive when we, lived, when we were living in New Jersey. But we wouldn't have been able to raise these kids so far away from our families without the people of the kingdom of God helping, babysitting, watching our kids without you guys. You know, moving here would have been much more scary, much more daunting for my wife and myself. And because of the church, you guys are family. And eventually you guys will become more than family. Aunts and uncles to our children, surrogate grandparents to our children. We're raising children, not just with the guidance of the scriptures and the Holy Spirit, but with the community of the people of God. Not just that, but I'm so grateful to God that as a teen disciple, as a campus student, and, and eventually as a single man, I didn't really have a great relationship with my own dad, but so many of the older men in the church became very much surrogate fathers and taught me how to be just a godly man and eventually a godly husband. And right now you're teaching me how to be a godly father. Your examples and wisdom teach me how to be a godly husband and one day raise children under the instruction of the scripture. So grateful for the kingdom of God, the people of God. And and, and I'm so amazed that uh, I just, I, I'm just so amazed that uh, I'm blessed in this way and I'm grateful to God, first and foremost, for all that God has blessed me with. I am what I am because of God and, and his kingdom. I owe everything to God. I owe everything to God. And so we're gonna talk about the power of gratitude. I want you guys to turn with me to Matthew chapter 20, 
And this is what true gratitude is about. It goes back to God. Matthew 20, we'll talk about that. Matthew 20 is the parable of the workers in the vineyard. And it's, uh, it's one of my favorite parables. It's not a very popular one, but it's one of my favorite. And here's why. Let's read it together. Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I'll pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those who came that were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, but you have made them equal to us who have been borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered them, Am I not being unfair to you? I am not being unfair to you, my friend. Didn't you agree to work for denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. You know, at first glance, you read this passage, you, it doesn't look like a passage about gratitude, but I tell you, it is. Verse 1 talks about how the kingdom of God is like a landowner, and of course, this, this landowner represents God, and this landowner, he goes out really, like in the ancient world, uh, it would be like a temp agency. You would look for workers, and early in the morning, uh, the working hours of the time would have been 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. I know traditionally in our society, 9 to 5, but back then, 6 a.m., 6 p.m., a 12-hour work day is a normal work day in the ancient Middle East. And so a landowner would have come out 6 a.m., looked for workers for the whole day, and that's what he did. He, he found workers uh, at 6 a.m., but then he comes back at the third hour or 9 a.m., he hires more workers. He comes back at noon, hires more workers. He comes back at 3 p.m., hires more workers. And then literally at the 11th hour or the second to last hour, uh, it's, it's, like, it's like hiring someone at 4 p.m., just for 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. He finds someone at 5 p.m. and hires more workers just for one hour's work. And they all get paid. And they get paid last to first. And the Bible says here that those who worked from 6 a.m. saw all those who are being paid one denarius, at those who contracted to work at 5 p.m., 3 p.m., and at noon. And so by the time it got to them, they're thinking, all right, we're going to get more. And they expected to get more. And then what happens is that everyone gets a denarius. And even as we read it, it kind of shocks us. And it's a little jarring because we actually think it's quite unfair. A group of people have only worked for one hour, get one denarius. Another group of people who are 12 hours also get one denarius. Yet, what we perceive as unfair, the landowner perceives as him being generous. The landowner cites the contract that everybody agreed to work for a denarius. So why are you complaining? The landowner even says that, don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money, even? And the landowner in this parable, he is fair because he pays them what he agreed to pay them. But upon further investigation, we find that the landowner is both fair and he's also generous. He's fair in that he pays all the workers, what he told them he would pay them, which was a denarius for a day's work. But yet, he's also generous 
because he didn't have to hire the second group of workers. Verse 3 says they were standing around doing nothing. He didn't have to hire the other group of workers because verse 7 says no one hired us. So it's really out of generosity that this landowner hires the second folks. It's out of generosity that anyone after 6 a.m. got hired by this landowner. So God is both, or this landowner is both fair, he's also incredibly generous. So what is this parable about? This parable is about God's generosity and specifically our attitudes towards God's generosity or God's grace is another way to saying that, or God's blessings or God's favor. And specifically, when we look at what we have or don't have, we look at our lives, we look at our romantic life, we look at our children, we look at our bank account, we look at our GPA, we look at our degree, we look at everything that we have in this life or perhaps all the things we don't have in this life, and we look at that and we either have gratitude or a bad attitude. Really, we have gratitude or a bad attitude. My first point is gratitude or a bad attitude. Because when you look at all you have, you either have gratitude or a bad attitude. Because in Christ, God is both fair in that he punishes sin, no one will get away with anything, and he's also generous. He's also generous in that he gives us so much of what we don't deserve. More on that later. He gives us redemption, the Holy Spirit, the forgiveness of our sins. God gives us a lot, even though we may not perceive to have been given a whole lot. But nonetheless, that generosity and God's grace towards us, it either exposes gratitude or ingratitude or a bad attitude. And the ingratitude starts to come out when the foreman hands out their pay. And the owner actually devised this plan with the foreman to deliberately play, per, deliberately pay those who are contracted last to be paid first so that really those who've been working the heat of the day, those who were working since 6 a.m. got a chance to see that those who were working at 5 p.m., they get a denarius. So it's almost like this landowner is, is checking these workers' hearts, and Jesus does that to us sometimes too, doesn't he? Doesn't he? I mean, you've been single for a while, and yet that newly baptized sister or brother is all of a sudden dating or engaged. You've been pining for that promotion at work, but that employee or that peer that you feel is less hardworking or less deserving gets the promotion over you. Sometimes great things happen to the people around us, not just to bless the people around us, but really to test our own hearts, to shape our own hearts, to mold our own hearts, to transform our own hearts, or really to expose what's really deep inside our hearts, whether that's gratitude or a bad attitude. But we, love, we live in a world of ingratitude, don't we? We live in a world of expecting more, unrelenting standards in our ungrateful hearts. I think we find something missing even in a blessing. Uh, we have this joke, first world struggles, right? We live in a first world. I know we're in a global pandemic, but there's just so many things we take for granted, so many privileges we have just because we're an American that others do not have. You know, uh, I was eating at Missions Barbecue and I noticed Man, there's no Diet Coke, right? It's, life is so bad, I gotta drink Diet Pepsi. I'm a Coke guy. You may be a Pepsi person, but I prefer Coke. But life was so bad, I had to drink Diet Pepsi instead of Diet Coke, you know? Uh, in some parts, uh, you're just lucky to get clean water and a, a drink. You know, I've been to my home country of Vietnam, and, and in some parts, I remember you'd be lucky just to have clear water. I'm in fellowship, you know, and in this church building, let me tell you, doesn't matter which, which carrier you have, you will not get a signal inside this building. Sometimes I'm complaining, man, I'm not connected to the world. Where's my LTE? Where, you know, I got one bar and I can't place a call. How am I going to check my email? First world struggles. Even right now with the social distancing and the mask and COVID-19, I know this virus is taking people's lives. I know it's serious, but if we just see all the bad and none of the good, we will fail to see the ways in which God is blessing us and God is still moving and God is still working. 
like I've mentioned, in a global pandemic, this church is still growing. People are still being baptized and restored. Bible studies are still taking place. People are still giving their contribution. We over exceeded our mission's contribution. All of that in COVID-19. We cannot miss the blessing, even in a tragedy. God is not socially distanced. God has not quarantined himself from us. God is still working. You know, uh, I love, I don't love, but I, I watch car commercials. And I don't know about you, but I'm very susceptible for some reason for advertising. I guess marketing people would love me. But I, I watch a car commercial and, and they just advertise some crazy things that I never thought I really needed. But after I watch them, I'm like, huh, I think I need heated front seats. You know, I got kids, I, I think I really need leather in my car. You know what? Some of our drives are pretty long. I think I need a TV in my car. And all those things they're advertising, you know, ironically enough, we, we bought a 2008 Honda Odyssey that has all those features, but that's, that's besides the point. But, but that's, that's the kind of world that we live in where more is better, bigger is better. It's always about the newest gadget, the newest thing. Your phone is outdated. You gotta get the new one. You deserve more, bigger is better. But I think this kind of thinking is dangerous when it infiltrates our faith. And it really does infiltrate our faith, doesn't it? It infiltrates our faith. We feel like we never have enough. Even with all of the blessings that God has given us, even with all of the blessings that God has blessed upon us, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. The Bible teaches us that we've received every spiritual blessing in Christ. Everything. Our sins are forgiven. We've been given the Holy Spirit. We have the community of believers in the manifestation of the kingdom of God, his body, the church. We have one another. We have the scriptures as a sword to defend against the enemy and the devil's schemes. We have been bought. Our bodies are no longer our own. We belong to God. Our citizenship is no longer on earth, but in heaven. We have so many spiritual blessings. We have all the spiritual blessings in Christ. But if you're like me, we walk around like, I want more. I want more money. I want a better job. I want a different relationship. I want a relationship. I want more kids or I want a kid. I want to retire. I want health. I want wealth. I need another car. I need a degree. I need that retirement. I need grandkids. I need to be debt free. But really, you and I, we have everything we have, would ever want and ever need in Christ. Why do I want more? And the sad reality is that because we are human, right now, we're expressing so much gratitude to all the workers and all the volunteers that have come to make this building beautiful. We're grateful for this building now. But there will come a time where we will complain about a building. Things will break, things will need to be maintained, and it's all part of ownership. But we cannot forget that at one point we didn't own a building. We cannot forget to be grateful. We must remember gratitude, otherwise, we will have a bad attitude. And the scary thing is, like this passage, when we are ungrateful, we start to get critical of people, but really, we start to get critical of God himself. Because when you're not grateful, you will begin to have a bad attitude. And that's what happens in this parable. You know, even Jesus, I mentioned all the things that God has blessed me with in my life, but Jesus' grace is my gratitude or my lack of gratitude has been exposed. It has been exposed. Jesus' generosity has exposed gratitude in my, ingratitude in my life or a bad attitude in my life. In 2013 or 14, I can't remember, a couple, some, some years ago, when my wife and I, we were uh, leading campus, Victoria was asked to speak at an ICMC and uh, 
And so she would a- was asked, and naturally I felt like, okay, they're also going to ask me. And so the weeks went by, uh, the days went by, and they never asked me. They never asked me to speak at ICMC. They asked my wife to speak and do a class at ICMC, but not me. And uh, frankly, honestly, uh, I took that very hard. Uh, I, I, I felt very insecure about that, that my wife was asked, but not me. And as a young campus minister at the time, I, I, I took that as uh, they don't value me or they don't respect me. And, but really, it was just all my insecurity and it was really just my arrogant entitlement. And, and really, that happened, I believe, from God because God was saying, you're not ready to speak or to preach here because I need you to work on yourself right now in your gratitude right now. And really, I remember that time I had to, you know, it's embarrassing to talk about it now, but it really exposed a lot of arrogance, a lot of insecurity and a lot of entitlement that, that, that here's a blessing from my wife and yet I make it all about myself. And it was a real turning point for me. You know, it was very arrogant. Who am I and what have I done in my 20s that I would feel entitled to be asked for such a task? You know. Really, honestly, I should be grateful to be a disciple. I should be grateful to be forgiven of my sins. I should be grateful to be serving God in the full-time ministry, working for the church. And really, frankly, I believe I'm in the ministry, not because I'm talented or gifted. It's because God said, I need you working in the church. Otherwise, you're working for the world. Otherwise, you'd wander away in your faith. And really, I believe I needed to get to heaven, right? I'm not that special. I'm not that talented. Uh, I need that amount of accountability and that amount of discipling and that much heart invested in God's kingdom. Otherwise, I just invest in the world and I would just wander away and drift away from the church and no longer be a disciple. That's what I know about myself. I am grateful to have the opportunity to serve the Rappahannock campus, the Potomac Valley Church in the capacity that I do, but I want to be honest, I don't do it for the recognition of no man, no woman, except the presence of God alone. It's not about the status, it's not about the recognition, it's about serving and and, 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 in the presence of God alone. Because ingratitude produces a bad attitude. You know, it's embarrassing to talk about it now because, you know, when I go to a conference, it's actually the other way now, I hope and pray I don't get asked to speak because I just wanna enjoy the conference. And when I do, I have to pray to surrender that. But I just wanna enjoy the conference. But you get my point, is that when God blesses us or blesses the people around us, it either exposes gratitude or a bad attitude. But here's the important point. Whatever I get, whatever I don't get, it doesn't matter because I get God. It doesn't matter because I get God. God doesn't promise us lives without worry, without distraction, without trauma, without trouble, without hardship. He just simply promises to be with us in the hardship, the trials, the trouble, the trauma. God, uh, you know, the Bible says that the rain falls on the righteous and the wicked. We, as Christians, we suffer just like the rest of the world. We are dying from this coronavirus, just like the rest of this world. We're not immune to what the world suffers with. We're not immune to harm. We're not immune to suffering. We're not immune even to doubt. But the only difference is that we get God on our side. God walks us with the pain. God walks us with the suffering. God walks with us in the hardship. Uh, One of my favorite books, if you wanna walk on water, you gotta get out of the boat by John Ortberg. He says, It's better to be in an unsafe, scary place with Jesus than to be in a seemingly safe place without Jesus. Think of that what you may, but you understand the idea that God promises that he will be with us to the very end of the age, and that means you go through trial, you go through hardship, just like the rest of the world. The only difference, Jesus walks alongside of us. There is no difference between our experience of life and the non-believer's experience of life 
except that we have God by our side. Like the agreement between the landowner and the workers for one denarius. As a disciple, we have an agreement with God. And God promises us really two things. We are guaranteed two things as a disciple on this earth. We're guaranteed service to the kingdom now and seeing Jesus later. That is all we're guaranteed. When you study the Bible, that's all you're promised. When you study the Bible and you said Jesus is Lord, you are not promised a wife. You are not promised a husband. You are not promised a job. You are not promised a promotion. You are not promised great health. You are not promised great wealth. You are not promised all of the things of the American dream. You are not promised any of that. But yet, it takes some time after walking with Jesus, we start to feel entitled to those things. We start to feel entitled to the American dream. And over time, what happens? To bad attitude instead of gratitude. But all we're promised is Jesus now and Jesus later. That's all we're promised. Service here now and heaven at the end of our days. But if you're like me, you expect more. And when you expect more, there will be ingratitude and a bad attitude. But if you have Jesus, what more could you want? Really, what more could you want? Recently, I looked up Bill Gates' net worth. As of this recording, Bill Gates is worth $115.6 billion. So Bill Gates could pay our special missions for the next millennium, essentially. And Bill Gates, curly, rich guy, successful guy, he's got it all. He can afford to pay all your debts and mortgage, but how silly would it be if Bill Gates said, I must have this podium, or I must have this table, or I must have this building, right? It, it'd be kind of silly. Because if you're Bill Gates, you could buy another building, you could buy another podium, you don't have to have this table, you, you can buy any table you want. You're worth $115.6 billion. It seems kind of silly to us. But the analogy I'm making is that we have Christ. We've got God. Our sins are forgiven. Our citizenship is in heaven, not on earth. But yet we walk around like, I must have this marriage, or I must have this car, or I must have this retirement, or I must be healthy, or I must have that promotion. But the reality is that, is that you don't need Jesus and a wife and a husband. You don't need Jesus and a car. You don't need Jesus and health. You don't need Jesus and retirement. You just need Jesus. You, don't not, you and I don't need Jesus and anything. I don't want to swap places with Bill Gates, maybe just for a second for him to pay my debt, but I don't want to swap, Bates, swap places with Bill Gates. You know, it's great if you stumble across a marriage, children, health, nice car, degree. It's great if you stumble across those things, I want that for you as much as I want that for myself, but you and I have Jesus. We don't need anything else. It's as silly as Bill Gates saying, I must have this table. Bill Gates doesn't need the table. You and I, we don't need all those other things. We just need Jesus. You know, when you become a Christian, like I've mentioned, all you're guaranteed is Jesus now, Jesus later. You and I didn't say Jesus is Lord, and we didn't count the cost and get baptized and become a disciple, expecting to be married, expecting to be uh, retired, expecting to be debt-free, expecting to have kids. But yet, why do we expect more than what we counted the cost about? That's where we begin to have a bad attitude. And even in our sinful nature, we often feel like we deserve these things that we ask for, but you and I don't deserve anything. In fact, According to the scriptures, you and I deserve death. The wages of sin is death. We deserve hell. So I'm grateful and I'm glad that Jesus doesn't give me what I deserve. And I'll gladly take whatever I can get because with that, with that in mind, everything that I have is a gift. Everything that I have is a blessing. It is all a gift. Your job, if you have a job, praise God, that's a gift. If you're married, praise God, that's a gift. If you have kids, praise God, that is a gift. If you are healthy, if you are retired, you have a 401k, you're set up, you're successful in life, 
Life is working the way you want it to. Praise God, I want that for you. I want that for all of us. That's a gift because ultimately, it doesn't matter what you get and don't get as long as you get Jesus. As long as you get Jesus. It's all a matter of perspective, isn't it? We don't even deserve Jesus, yet we get him. And many of us, we get even more. Anything I get, I really don't deserve. It's all a gift, and it's all a matter of perspective. You know, before I was a Christian, I was a hot mess. I was a teenager. I was a hot mess. In the kingdom, as a Christian, I'm a hot mess, okay? You guys don't have to let me preach. I don't deserve to speak and teach about these things. I've got as many issues. I'm a huge mess to this day, as many issues as the next sinner. I'm not teaching you something you don't already know. To me, I'm humbled that you would even consider what I have to say. I'm grateful to have an audience. I'm a blessed man. I'm healthy. I've got a beautiful wife, beautiful children. I don't deserve any of this. One day, so that they don't have entitlement and they don't have a bad attitude, so that they know where all this comes from, I want them to be known for their gratitude. One day, I will tell my children, the reason why mommy and daddy love each other, the reason why we love you, the reason why we are different is because God has been good to us. The reason why we cherish this moment we have with you and we love the life that we have and we have the life that we have is because God has been good to us. I don't want them to forget that this all comes from God, that everything we have is a gift of God. I don't want them to forget this all belongs to God. And here's why this is so important. When you view everything from the lens of gratitude, Christianity becomes so much easier. Point number one, gratitude or a bad attitude. Second point and last point, gratitude makes it easy. You know, as difficult as walking with Jesus can be, gratitude makes it easy. Turn your Bibles with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You know, it's interesting the direction of the Holy Spirit. This passage has been shared last week and the week before, and it's gonna be shared today, this morning. Second Corinthians chapter five. We should know it by heart by now, since it's been shared every week. But second Corinthians chapter five, starting in verse 14. For Christ's love compels us, because we're convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. And I love this passage because it says, what compels us to live the lives that we live? What compels us to share our faith? What compels us to serve? What compels us to keep giving? What compels us to keep investing, not on things, of, not on, things on earth, but things in heaven? What compels us? It's not leadership. It doesn't say leadership compels us. It doesn't say the church compels us. It doesn't say people pleasing compels us. It doesn't say any of those things compel us. It says Christ's love compels us. You know, the Greek word is very ambiguous. Is it our love for God that compels us? Or is it God's love for us that compels us? And I think the reason why it's ambiguous is purposeful. It is both. Our love for God and God's love for us should compel us to live the lives that we live. It should compel us to gather, to serve, to multiply. It should compel us to share our faith. It should compel us to keep giving, keep investing, keep loving, keep working on our character, keep having challenging talks, keep receiving challenging talks. It's Christ's love. You know, another translation says Christ's love constrains us. That means that when you feel loved by God, you feel God's love and you know that God loves you, your options are limited. When you love God and God loves you, sin should no longer be an option. Not giving should no longer be an option. Not serving, sitting in the sidelines should no longer be an option. It's the love of God and God's love for us. When you love God and God loves you, you are motivated to do anything. We are called to live a grateful Christian, we're called to live a grateful Christianity for God, by the grace of God, motivated by the grace of God. Listen, I've been a Christian only for 16 years, but here's my conclusion. 
based on my own life and based on some of your stories. Walking with Jesus is hard. Christianity is hard. Maybe especially in 2020, in COVID-19, in an election year. Life may be even be harder for Christians than non-Christians because God is trying to shape us and mold us. We're not going with the way of the world. We're going against the grain, against the world. But Christian, Christianity is hard. Listen, marriage is hard without Jesus. Marriage is hard even with Jesus. <laughs> Life is hard without Jesus. Life is hard even with Jesus. Parenting is hard. Parenting is hard even with Jesus. Life is just hard. But you know what? Gratitude makes it easy. Gratitude makes it easy. The only way for us to live out this difficult life is to have Christ's love compels us. When I understand God's love, and I know that God loves me, and I love God, I want to be serving. I want to be giving. I want to keep my life in alignment with righteousness. I want to keep sharing my faith. I want to be with the body. I want to be holy. I want to live for God, compelled by God's love for me. I want to live for Jesus being overwhelmed with gratitude. But you know what? Instead of that kind of radical Christianity, being compelled by the love of God and God's love for me, I often live a life that's just dutiful. Doing it because it's right. Serving because I know it's the right thing to do. Sharing my faith because I know it's the right thing to do. Loving because I know it's the right thing to do. And instead of yes, I get to go to church, and yes, I get to be with my brothers and sisters. It's, okay, I, I, I guess I'll meet with that brother. I guess I'll hang out with that sister. I, I, I guess I'll give that person a ride. But what is that? Jesus didn't die so that I could feel obligated to serve. Jesus died so that I could be radically changed in my way of thinking, in my way of living, so that I could serve God overwhelmed with gratitude overwhelmed with the grace of God. This life is difficult, but grace and gratitude makes it easy. Are you grateful in your Christianity? Or are you dutiful in your Christianity? This life is difficult. Gratitude and grace makes it easy. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. Paul writes, he says, By the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace to me, was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. When he says all of them, he says all the other apostles. So Paul's basically saying, hey, I worked harder than Peter. I worked harder than John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. I worked harder than all the other apostles who, mar who were martyred for their faith. I worked harder than all of them. But he says, not in a boasting way, he says, yet I'm not I, but the grace of God that was within me. So God's grace, the power of gratitude is the power of God's grace. And when God's grace has its intended effect in your life, you will work harder than anyone and everyone. The intended effect of grace is action and transformation. I believe in the kingdom. Those who serve the hardest, who work the most, are the ones who are the most grateful. Those who are unpaid and volunteer to come here, to take out the trash, to mow the lawn, to paint, Write your name on the ground before we laid the carpet. Those who have just made this beautiful building what it is out of, the, out of your heart to serve. It's because of gratitude. Gratitude for God's grace. Those who are involved in family groups. Those are the people who are grateful to God. Those who give to special missions in a pandemic. Those are the grateful people of God. Those who are still sharing their faith, studying the Bible with people, meeting with people, discipling people, gathering, even via in person or in Zoom. Those are the grateful people of God. The service teams that we have these soft openings, those who are in the front line, those are the grateful people of God. That's the power of gratitude. Grateful people can do things that normal people cannot do. I believe that. The natural gravitational pull for all of us and the church is towards graceless religion and graceless faith and replacing that grace with a set of rules and traditions. That's the natural gravitational pull for us, but we cannot forget the power of gratitude. Gratitude will take away that legalism. 
Gratitude will take away that graceless faith and replace it with a religion based on God's grace. Because when you're motivated by fear or results, there are limitations to what you're willing to do. You know, fear burns hot, but will not last. Status, recognition, burns hot, but will not last. People pleasing, burns hot, but will not last. Structure, religion, burns hot, but will not last. When you don't have gratitude, you will get lost in today's world, in the worries of this world. Grateful people, you know, they're not, they're not arguing about politics and who will be our president, next president, although that's important. Grateful people are first and foremost interested in serving the one King Jesus, regardless of who our commander in chief will be. God's got it, okay? I know you guys are concerned. God knows who our next president will be. God's got it. God's got it. We have to submit to whoever that president will be, whether or not we like it or not. Because even Jesus submitted to Pilate, and what does he say? He says, you don't have any authority outside of the authority my father gave you. Jesus recognized earthly authority. Jesus submitted to earthly authority. Grateful people are too busy serving in the kingdom of God to be caught up in what the world is trying to do. Everything must go back to gratitude or we will have a bad attitude. Everything is because of God's generosity and grace. And that in the end is why we live and strive to make every effort to align our lives with righteousness. We're generous because we're grateful for God's generosity to us. We give because God has already given to us. We evangelize, share our faith because we're grateful that God has saved us. We serve because we're grateful that Jesus didn't come to be served, but instead to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Next week, we'll talk about the power of unity. We're going to appoint more deacons and deaconesses that will meet and serve the needs of the church. But a desire for unity, it must come from a place of gratitude. It's about God. To those who served and to those who worked and built this building, renovated this building, cleaned this building, maintained this building, we want to say thank you. Thank you from the bottom of our heart. Thank you. But it's about God. We're all broken people who are grateful to Jesus. If you don't have gratitude, most likely you'll have a bad attitude. And that's not fun. Christianity, bad attitude, not a good combination. That's a difficult Christianity, but gratitude makes it easy. I believe that if we remember the power of gratitude, souls will be saved, lives will be restored, families will be built, hungry will be fed, people will be healed, cities and counties will be transformed, to the glory and image of God. So Rappahannock Campus, don't forget the power of gratitude. Remember the power of gratitude. Prince William Campus, remember the power of gratitude. Those watching on our digital media campus, remember the power of gratitude. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your incredible grace that you've lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. We pray that we don't forget where we come from. We know that whoever has been forgiven much loves much. Whoever has been forgiven little loves very little. And we're so grateful that you love us so much to forgive all of our sins. We pray that we don't ever forget the power that gratitude can bring. We're so grateful to be in this building. We want to thank those who built this building, but we know that it's all about you. We love you, God, so much. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.